So a very, very good morning uh, from India and good evening from United States. So today we are here for a new session and we are inviting Colonel Ajay Ramakrishnan sir as our new speaker and he will be sharing his topic. He will be sharing his experience with us. But before that, let me introduce him and let me share my screen first. So here we go. Colonel Ajay Ramakrishnan sir is the founder of Ambition Mantra Leadership and Careers. He is in panel leadership coach for Indian Oil Corporation, Bukhi International, BCG and KPMG projects and various institutions. He is business executive leadership and resilience coach, experimental learning facilitator and master mentor, career coaching. He worked on the Prime Minister Capacity Building Project named Karmi Yogi Mission, involved in training of over 1,000 trainers for the railways as well as the police of various trade trees. His expertise are in, uh, are in visualization, planning and education of high profile transformation, capacity building learning and development programs for corporates, ranging from entry level to senior management for MNCs like Microsoft, SAP, Accenture, Mercantage Wage, Titan, HSBC, JP Morgan, Chase, Buki International, Society General, uh, Titan, ITC, IBM, Union Bank of India, Andhra Bank, and Corporation Bank. Awarded the Sena Medal, Medal Gallantry, the highest gallantry award of the Indian Army. Project management of several critical infrastructure projects, including roads, school, laboratories, and a complete township for over 12,000 troops and their families. Commanded for sustainability projects, green space, water recycling, solar energy projects, waste management, etc. Technologically adapt, hence on his skills on simulators, electronic system and state of the art security system. Visualizing, assessing crafts of security and official standard operating procedures, SOPs for critical installation, helipads, airports, logistic, zones, etc. So welcome, sir. It's our pleasure to have you on our platform. Welcome to IFBIC and you can share your uh, topic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Namaste from Gangtok, where I'm right now. And uh, greetings to all our viewers, wherever they are on the globe. Honored to be here. Thank you so much, uh, Molly, Alok, and Amresh for getting me onto this platform. Looking forward to being of value to IFBIC. Allow me to share my screen as we start the topic. Is my screen visible fully? Yes. And clearly? Yes, yes, yes. We are living in an era of amazing opportunities. And these opportunities are directly or indirectly a result of various factors, which is what we are going to see. There is no doubt that the last five to seven years have created an extremely volatile, uncertain, definitely chaotic, and uh, quite an ambiguous environment. My experience, having worked in the armed forces and uh, various uh, other uh, similar domains, wherever there is uncertainty, two things come. First and foremost, there are maximum opportunities. Secondly, there are no restrictions. There are no boundaries. Whatever we think can become a reality. So with this, let's get into more of how this presentation is going to go. Very short presentation, just eight or nine slides. We'll discuss certain perspectives which are critical. What are the opportunities which are emerging because of these perspectives? A little bit of information about me and areas where I think I can contribute to IFBIC. Sit back, relax, and allow me to take you on a journey. We are going to take a journey through time. We'll first talk about the rates of change that humanity has seen. 
let's go back in time 1903 it's the year 1903 and uh, the world is uh, waiting expectantly 17th of december it's somewhere in california long beach and uh, two brothers orwell and wilbur wright they're trying to fly the first heavier than air machine and they succeed 17th of december 1903 man made the first heavier than air flight a great event it changed the way everything was going to happen in the future what impact did it have at that point of time excepting for history books a big fat zero nothing happened it did not affect anybody else yes it made the news champagne a lot of partying but it did not affect anybody else the next the first commercial flight actually took place in 1914 it was a very short 23 minute flight between uh, tampa bay and uh, st petersburg and they could carry only two passengers that lasted for two months and again nothing changed nothing happened it was only after the second world war post 1945 that aviation actually came into being and commercial flying took on using military surplus planes. Let's fast forward a little bit from 1903, 1908, Henry Ford came out with the Model T Ford, the first commercial car ever. So what? It didn't make a difference to most people because most people could not afford to buy it and uh, there were no roads or infra actually to run it. It took another 30 years before automobiles actually took off. Again, a little bit of fast forward. The year is 1969. Before this, the US and Russia were engaged in a space race, trying to get satellites up and, you know, Yuri Gagarin made the first uh, circumnavigation of the globe in space and 1969 saw the world looking expectantly at Neil Armstrong. One small step for me, one giant step for mankind. Great. So what? Again, I'll keep asking, so what? The computing power which was used for the moonshot was a great uh, feat at that point of time. This is 1969. Please note the timeline. In 1973, Nintendo launched its first video game. The computing power of that video game was more than the computing power which was used in 1969, just four years later. Let's move ahead. We come to 1975. 1975, Cray computers were launched. That was the first supercomputer in the world. And again, the world went crazy. Supercomputer. It filled up a whole room and uh, it used to overheat. So many things were there. It was something crazy. But it was a supercomputer. And if any other nation wanted to use it, it had to pay a princely sum to another nation which had that supercomputer. Again, so what? Just fast forward another 20 years. 2007. Steve Jobs launched the iPhone. That small device, that iPhone, had more computing power than the Cray supercomputer. Why did this happen? It all happened because of a prophecy or a law or, a, uh, you know, the foresightedness of one man named Gordon Moore, who was the boss of Intel, which manufactured these chips. And he said, the power of computing is going to double every two years or rather what he actually said was that the number of semiconductors or transistors on one chip is going to double every two years which is what is bringing us to where we are today the exponential growth in computing power is what has changed the world exponentially rapidly in the last five to seven years and we see disruptive technology, artificial intelligence, possible only because of Moore's law, because of the way computing power has actually uh, come into being, 5G. 
augmented reality, digital workspaces, all possible only because of the extensive computing power which has come about because of the way technology has grown and because of a prophecy which is now a law. That's one perspective which we need to keep in mind when we look at anything. Why? I'll come to later. The next thing is the last three, four years have seen us dealing with various pandemics in terms of, uh, you know, COVID was there, then we have monkey flu, this flu, that flu, something or the other is happening. So that's another factor which is playing at the back of our mind. It is affecting the way we think. So when we look at all these changes, let's get on to the effect on our mindset. How does it affect our mindset? There is no doubt in the present age, we are in a very volatile, uncertain, chaotic, and ambiguous environment. There's no doubt. Nobody today can predict with certainty what's going to happen tomorrow. Maybe you can make an educated guess, add some data, but we never know when that little computing power is going to come and change things. I'll give an example of this. Before the exponential changes which happened in computing power, everything revolved or evolved around big things like corporates coming up, steel and stuff like that. Big industries. Yet, in 2011, it was one small app, one small app, which went on to become the most valuable startup in the world or the world has ever seen. And that was possible only because of Moore's law and the computing power which is available. I'm talking about Uber. In 2011, Uber revolutionized the way things happen. And it's just an app. The basic concept of Uber is just an app. So everything is changing around us, yet we are human version 1.0. The human being has not changed. So there are so many things which are playing on our minds. We are maybe sometimes looking at things in the correct perspective. Maybe we need to realign our thought processes. Because of this volatility, uncertainty, chaos, we are sometimes thinking long term, sometimes thinking short term and confused most of the time. If I start thinking long term, I suddenly find that something is happening. There's some change happening which is, you know, sort of jumbling up my thinking. If I think short term, then I get worried. Is this going to work out? Why isn't it not going to work out in the long term? Is it going to work out in the short term? So this is leading to an analysis paralysis for a lot of leaders across industries, across uh, domains. I work with a majority of them at the very senior levels, and uh, this, these are the challenges which they face. And that's why I'm sharing it here. And it's a reality. Look at how we are. You, you speak to anybody today, whether it, that guy is a prince or a pauper, it doesn't matter. Say, okay, things are okay. You know, life is going on well, but you know, there's something which I'm not able to put my finger on it, but there's something which is happening. That something is that uncertainty which is happening that, you know, that little bit of small, small changes that keep happening around us, we are still trying to align ourselves and balance ourselves with that. I go to a cup, uh, uh, cup of Joe's for uh, coffee every evening. And uh, suddenly I find that this guy, uh, I walked into it and, uh, you know, he says, now we're going to scan this app and only then I can give you your coffee. There's a QR code and all. I said, come on, I've been a customer for the last three years. You can't do that to me. He said, no, you've got to do it. So that's these are small, small changes which are happening around us and they are affecting us. So along, we started off this presentation by stating that wherever there is chaos and uncertainty, there are opportunities. So what are the opportunities which uh, are out there? First and foremost, uh, transforming leadership. Leadership has to be transformed because they are the decision makers and they are dealing with organizations, funds, people, growth. And if 
they are left in an ambiguous situation. It is going to cause a decision dilemma, which is going to cascade down to everybody. The organization, investors, people around us, from top to down, is going to be a matter of concern. I've just been sent a text uh, by Devakar, who says that uh, Buka has become Duka because of huge disruptions in the place. In place. Actually, this is absolutely right. Volatility has led to a lot of disruption. That's why we're talking about it today. Uh, the next thing which comes up is capacity building. We've had the great resignation coming in. We've had workplaces being challenged for manpower, human power. We've had corporates trying to get in people from here, there, and everywhere to try and cope up with the way things are. So look at it this way. On one hand, we have tech, which is revolutionizing and changing every minute. And on the other hand, we have experienced workforces who are moving away from the workforce and uh, getting into the great resignation, doing things, getting to start us, whatever. Where is or who is going to bridge this gap? That's where capacity building is required. And capacity building is something which is of paramount requirement anywhere you take any industry today the churning of human resource is so much that capacity building has to be quick it has to be effective and it has to have an roi otherwise we are reaching stages where an industry is moving forward and it's suddenly stopping because the manpower or the human resource is not able to cope up with the rate of change of that industry The next point where I feel that uh, opportunities exist is vision creation. Yeah, I know vision creation, everyone talks about it, you know, ideation, vision. It's, it's, these are all English words which we've used in so many presentations and stuff like that. Agreed. What's the difference? In previous times, before, let's say, maybe another, the past five, six years, vision was the domain of leaders, big people. They went into boardrooms, conference rooms, made a lot of PPTs, saw a lot of things, then created something and out came a vision. Today, while that is equally important, what's important is having the ability and capability of getting the entire workforce aligned to a vision. Why? Unless a workforce from bottom to top is aligned with a particular vision. You're going to face this churning. You're going to face this uh, volatility of people leaving, inability of people to cope up with change. And that enterprise is not going to get the results it set out for itself. So in all this, we are uh, seeing a world where things are changing rapidly. We are needing to challenge leadership. We are needing to change the way leadership thinks capacity building, vision creation. And in all this, we must also keep in mind that uh, we have only one planet Earth. This is a challenge where everyone has been talking sustainability. Everyone has been talking sustainability. The groundwork which is being put in now because of the realization which came about probably because of the pandemic and uh, various other people going through uh, you know, life-changing experiences and uh, Looking at life and work and profit differently, sustainability is something which is extremely important in this day and age. So these are the opportunities which uh, came to my mind, transforming leadership, capacity building, vision creation, and sustainability. Coming down to being slightly egoistic and talking about myself, I've been a soldier. I was in the army for uh, around 20 years. Uh, been there, done that. I was in the infantry, fought a few battles, did uh, uh, stuff. I mean, it's all there in the bio, so you can read about it later. It gave me a lot of great experiences in terms of capacity building. It gave me experiences in uh, sustainability projects, infra, and uh, uh, even the opportunity to, to create small cities for or townships. So that's been a great uh, experience for me as a soldier. 
I've been a pilot. I flew in the Kargil war. I flew helicopters in the war as well and uh, transformed or translated that experience and became a commercial pilot. I've been flying in civil aviation now. And uh, as that went on, I realized that uh, there's so much more to do because I've always been involved with training and uh, capacity building. I went on to become a coach and uh, again, without being egoistic, I hold the best credentials the world can offer in terms of a coach. I'm certified by the International Coach Federation. I'm certified by Marshall Goldsmith. I'm certified by the Global Coach Group. I'm certified by Daniel Goldman and uh, Richard Bandler for Neuro Linguistic Programming. So putting all these experiences and everything together, I started a small uh, consulting organization called Ambition Mantra, through which I conduct a program called 21st Century Leadership and various other leadership projects including a program called the Da Vinci Mode, where I talk about creativity and uh, innovation. How can I contribute? Based on my background, the experiences I've been, some of the areas uh, where I feel I have the cap capability to contribute to IFBIC is definitely in transforming leadership, bringing about new thought, experimenting, evolving. I've handled projects, big, small, across uh, geographies, hostile terrain, hostile environments. So any project is something which I can manage for IFBIC. I have ext extensive experiences in the Northeast, having built up infra in uh, Arunachal, Mizoram, Manipur, Nagaland, and uh, that included uh, working with the governments and setting up aviation and tourism synergies for the arm army, the people of the state to use in all these places. Sustainability projects have been uh, part of my life uh, in uh, the armed forces. And uh, that's something which is very close to my heart. And that's something which I feel is uh, an area we really need to work. Again, capacity building. Across industries, I've had the experience. I was part of uh, the Prime Minister's initiative called uh, Karmyogi, where we went, uh, partnered with the Indian Railways, went down to the grassroots levels, selected. Firstly, we analyzed what is required. And like I said earlier, we are looking for fast turnarounds. Nobody has time to train people for one month. We need to build capacity by creating programs which are short, intense, and effective. So this program which we built for the railways, that was uh, just a seven-day program. Two days, we trained them. Two days, we made them train us. We made them train us in four days. And in the fifth day, we allowed them to do their presentations and release them to go and train the rest of the workforce. A similar project as again part of the Karmiyogi program we did with the police forces of uh, Pondicherry, Goa and also with uh, the Delhi police recently. So that's uh, as far as the areas and I'm sure with the vision and the foresight which uh, the people in this forum have, I'm sure you would be able to find uh, even more areas where my experiences and uh, energies could be used for uh, the benefit of IFBIC. I've come to the end of uh, what I had to present. Any discussion, any questions, we can go about it now. Uh, sir, uh, sir, you can, uh, you know, in yes, this Molly, please. Uh, please go ahead, Molly. I have a question. Um, thank you so much for the beautiful presentation. I learned a lot about you and, and what you can do. Uh, amazing. That's that's amazing. But the question I have is, what is your greatest challenge when working with military staffs? Actually, that's a very loaded question. <laughs> and uh, there are uh, two sides to it. And I'll uh, cover it from both perspectives. A little bit of background is important for this. Military training and requirements are based on a set piece thought process and a well 
structured program. Reason being, when you go into battle, we don't want people to be asking questions. Why me? Come on, you should have chosen somebody else. Why me? I, I mean, I've got a family and stuff like that. We don't need such people. So there is a particular mindset which is required. There is a way of going about orders and execution. So there's no challenge in that, definitely. But the challenge emerges because over a period of time when we are so used to taking orders, thinking out of the box, thinking innovatively, that is a challenge. But, but, there's always a but. Let's change the canvas and get on to the special forces. I've operated with special forces and uh, there, because of the training, because of the mindset and because of being comfortable in a VUCA or a DUCA environment, we are, we have trained ourselves, we have uh, established the ability to actually think out of the box. And because of that, what I've come to realize and answer to your question, the challenge in a military environment is if you're working in a place where innovation is required, a different thinking is required, getting that sort of information and getting that sort of those sort of people is slightly challenging. So you need to be able to operate with uh, two sets of people, one set of people who are innovative in their thought process. So that's part of leadership. You identify people in your team who are innovative, who can think out of the box, who can, uh, who first of all know what the box is. Only then can you think out of the box. And you keep them as a core team. And then you have a team for execution. Guys who follow uh, what is required to be done without questioning and do it the way you have specified. So that's the challenge. The challenge is in identifying who is who. And in the shortest period of time, because you go into a new team, you don't have time. You don't have time to identify. So that's where your capability as a person, as a leader, to be able to identify such a talent is uh, important. Thank you. I hope I've been able to answer your question, Molly. Yes, it's a beautiful answer. Thank you so much. Uh, Devakar you. also has a question, I think. Devakar, please go yeah. ahead. Hey, uh, Ajay, uh, great. Uh, thank you so much for that, uh, such an uh, insightful and enlightening presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, we have been projecting ourselves as a startup capital of the globe and uh, a lot of buzz has been around the entrepreneurship uh, uh, seriously pursuing in India now. Do you uh, really see that kind of a skills uh, do our people have or is there anything has to be imparted more in those areas? For entrepreneurial growth. Do you want an honest answer or a politically correct answer? <laughs> Straight from the heart, honest. <laughs> uh, my personal, at the risk of uh, raising a few hackles, this startup craze is more of greed rather than need or capability. I'm sorry to say that. Now, allow me to talk a little bit on creativity. And uh, then maybe we can get to the genesis of what is required. Leonardo da Vinci was one of the greatest creators, inventors, or thinkers of all time. He wrote a 76-page book called The Codex. And if you Google it, Bill Gates paid, I think, upward of uh, 26 or $36 million for uh, uh, 20, 30 odd pages of that codex. So that's the highest value any book has been sold or any page has been sold. So why am I sharing this? I'm sharing this because of a particular reason. When Leonardo da Vinci, he made a very important statement. He said, all knowledge flows through perception. The, our knowledge is based on how we perceive the world, right? And how do we perceive the world? We perceive the world through our five senses. Now, herein is where the penny drops. How much time has our educational system, our environment actually given us 
to hone those senses. When Leonardo da Vinci used to paint, he used to get his friends to play music. They didn't have uh, Spotify then. So they used to play music for him. He had the finest aromas. He used to dress up in his best clothes. And in that creative mood and mode, he used to paint. In our own history, in our own Indian history, all our princes and well-to-do uh, families, the children learned cooking, they learned uh, archery, they learned music, they learned dance. Whether you are a male or female, it did not matter. You look back in our culture. And why did they do this? They did this to hone their senses. And because their senses were honed and aligned and uh, so sensitive, they found solutions, they found innovations. Today, we have a school system where a child goes. You see a child, you take a small child. A small child is curious. Just watch a very small child. The child goes around the room, you know, touching everything, even wanting to, uh, you know, smell it, lick it, taste it, because that's how we perceive the world. But no, we have parents, no, don't do that, stop this, what are you doing? Come here. And this child is then put into the school system. Now, before this, the child is asking all sorts of questions, all sorts of questions. But now the child is part of a system called the school. And in that school, the child is told, don't ask questions. Chapter one has got four questions. You must know the answer to only these four questions. No other question is important. So the child loses its ability to ask questions, which is what you need to do to have a startup, my friend. To innovate, to create, you have to ask questions. We have lost out on our ability to perceive the world around us. We have lost out on the ability to ask the right questions. There is research which says that most children are born at a genius level, IQ. And then we put them to school. And uh, there are t-shirts which say, you know, I was so-and-so till the time education ruined me. It's actually a fact. So coming back to the question which you asked uh, about uh, startups. Yes, there are a few people with genuine, actual, creative ideas. But they are so lost out because there's so many people clamoring for, you know, uh, uh, in, uh, investment and startup. I, I'm doing this. I'm going to do this. But how many startups are actually succeeding? Maybe one in 10. And I'm being generous. And the reasons is reasons are what I have outlined. That innovative thought is actually not there in most of us. I'm sorry to have uh, been a wet blanket on a very, very, you know, contemporary question. But uh, unfortunately, as a soldier, I shoot from the hip and uh, speak the truth. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that answer. Ram. Thank you very much. Uh, I have somebody else uh, who's raised a hand. I think uh, Molly again has a question. Please go ahead, Molly. Molly, okay, Amrish, I guess Amrish, okay, Amrish, go first. Yeah, Amrish, okay. go ahead. Uh, actually, I don't have a question, but I have to say uh, on the you know failure of the startup, especially in India. See what is happening in India. For the leadership, talent should be transferred to the talent. But what is happening in India? The, you know, uh, leadership is being transferred to the family members. No matter what type of talent he is having, they are having. They are the, it is being transferred to them. And if you know, opportunities or leadership is being transferred to the in, uh, inappropriate member. You can never have a good startup or successful startup in India, in any part of the world. The second thing is that when new things or new technology used to come uh, into the market, the entire world, uh, especially India is a crowded, uh, you know, uh, country. And we have a culture here of resting. If we have a very good place, we stop learning. So when computer was launched in the banking sector, uh, I think you all uh, are very known to the dilemma that how the experts of this industry, uh, uh, you know, came against of it and they said that this banking, uh, this computer is going to steal the entire job of uh, country and the banking sector is going to be into the big trouble. 
that was not the truth. The truth is that the people who are having a very easy life, they were not interested in learning and they were they, they have just hawked the entire system like a spider cop and they thought that if new technology will come, the new generations have the sharp mind, they have a, uh, you know better in uh, knowledge than us and they are going to take you know our opportunity. So we are, they were not interested in learning. And the same thing is happening these days. Especially what is the problem with the startups today that most of the startups don't have the proper, uh, uh, pro uh, proper fund. And when you, they go for the seed fundings, they are very much misled there. You know how a seed funding uh, uh, is done in India? Suppose that if you need a uh, 100 rupees, they will tell you just, yes, I'm going to give you 200 rupees. And they will give you around 10 rupees or 15 rupees, you know, and they will say you that now start after one year or after whenever you will need the money, you will get the uh, fund from us. But when you need the second step of funding, second uh, of funding, they will uh, tell you that, no, we are not going to give you the fund because, you know, you have not given the results. Just imagine when the startup started, they were having expectations of rupees 100 uh, in their pocket or in their term plan. But when someone invested rupees 10, they are now expecting the result of rupees 100 or 1000. They have invested rupees 10 and they are expecting the result of 1000. And that is the only reason. See, every startup, they don't have the experience. They are, you know, they used to remain in the learning phase. And that is where, you know, uh, they fail, but it should be the uh, responsibility of the funders. It should be the responsibility of the experienced people that this, when they are investing, they should keep in mind that a startup who is working on that, they should be paid a first salary. And most of the startups in India are not getting the salary that they, they deserve. They remain in tension. They are not able to fulfill their own needs as a result startups used to fail. And when someone is having a very good investment with their father and mother, you know, if you, I uh, just, I'm giving you example that if you are getting any project from the government and uh, that is only for the recommendation, that should not be a success of a startup. That is the illegal use of the power you are doing in any country. So I don't know why startups are being blamed every time for the failure, but we should see that what is the scenario in, in any country. And uh, we have a very unfortunate ambience in the, our country that uh, any flock actor or actress family members are getting more followers than the, any startups. And the vitriolic truth of the startup is that when you will start, your own family will become your enemy. It's everyone is looking out for the job, but no one is there to support their startups. So <laughs> we, we have to think, we have to uh, change our mindset because uh, only organization or startups are the future of any country, more the companies you will be having, more the employment you will be having and see the condition of India, it's really horrible. Employment is going to be the biggest problem of this country in future. So we need to think again and again before blaming any startup and we should, we should just research that why startups are being failed, why it is not being succeeded. succeeded. That's all I have to say. Yeah, that's that's definitely there and uh, in fact uh, i'm seeing the chat yes there are a lot of legal issues also there is a lot of funding issues also a lot of procedures we are not denying that those are subsequent challenges the first challenge and where our focus should be is my idea worthy of a startup that is the question which i was addressing okay now i may have a fantastic idea it may not be commercially viable. I will not get funding for it. Okay. So there are, along with ideas, being a startup is one very small part of the canvas. An idea has to be viable. It has to be something which is the need of the hour. It has to address the requirement of society at that point of time. If your idea is going to be useful 50 years hence, it may be a fantastic idea, but it may not work today. Sir, I, for that. Sir, just for the intervention, who will decide that idea is viable or not? When Netflix was launched, people said that it's a rubbish idea. When Facebook was launched, it, people said it's a rubbish idea. So when the new technology was, when Apple fall down on the earth, people said that gravitation is a rubbish idea. So these patents, these uh, you know genius people, they used to oppose the new technology. Don't you think that if someone is having any idea, government should take, uh, you know, uh, Government should have a look on that. They should invest there because we have a budget for research and development for the entire world. And we know that 100 out of 99 research used to fail. 
but when elon musk used to you know dump a satellite that's a, oh wow he just uh, he's a great man he has done lots of uh, he has seen the failures and now he's having a success but a common man if he will uh, lose he's a loser he's not having a good idea so who will decide that these ideas are wonderful and we have seen idea has created the miracles there are many companies in india who those are having uh, you know history of 300 years 400 years to make a giant company and we have seen there are many companies in the world like Facebook, Google, they came in our lifetime and now they are dominating. They are the biggest you know, platform. They are the biggest industries and they have seen the success that these traditional business will see in their lifetime. So who will decide that idea is viable or not and who will take risk on that? That is, I think, the biggest question that we all need to consider. Who will take that risk? Now, the way I see it, I have a fantastic idea. The challenge is in reaching out to a person who has a similar vision, who resonates with my idea and who's willing to invest. That is a search. That is a matter of destiny. It's a matter of chance. It may or may not happen. It's sad. A lot of good ideas have uh, been uh, sorted up at some point of time. And a lot of uh, not so good ideas have come up. But that's the way it is. That's the reality. Coming on to governance. I agree with you. Governance has to be such that uh, it gives uh, opportunity to such uh, startups and it actually is uh, capable of uh, discerning which are the startups to be uh, you know, uh, looked up to and nurtured. As a nation, I'm talking purely of India, as a nation, we are evolving. In that evolution, governance is at a particular crossroad where it really is unable to understand what it should be doing and what it should not be doing. Should it be purely into governance or should it be into profit generation? Should it be into you know uh, ideation, creation? So these are all challenges which are happening because of all the things which we discussed earlier in the presentation. We are living in a disruptive, uncertain, chaotic, and ambiguous world. So even governance is in the same world, right? And they are also the same human beings. So it's going to take time for all this to uh, sort out. And in this time, there are visionaries in governance also. There are visionaries in governance. That's why you are having this platform. And that is why uh, your event in UP is happening. It's because there's somebody who has a vision and who thinks that uh, it should be done. It may be slow, it may be a meandering process, but it's happening. It may not happen at the pace at which we want. In the meantime, what we can do is uh, keep our eyes open, try our best, and wherever we can provide opportunities to a great idea or a good idea whose time has come, we should do that. Molly, I think uh, it's time for you waited patiently for a while. With the, the same thought of uh, startups and leadership, um, what are the few qualities that you feel a leader should have in a brand new company coming up? What are the virtues do you think that befits a leader or a leader should have? That's again a loaded question. You are coming to me with all guns blazing today. Okay. So here we go. The first important quality or capability a leader should have is the capability to make mistakes. I'm not saying it in a semantic way or in a theoretical way. If we are afraid of making mistakes, we will move along the cut and dried path. We will seldom stray from the mainstream. And as a result of that, creativity will not come into us or we will not give an opportunity for any creative thought which comes in from our team. So in this day and age where we are living in disruptive times and uncertainty, chaos, ambiguity, whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter. You can give it any term, like dukkha, wukka, it doesn't matter. It's, it's tough. So we need to have people, leaders who are willing to make mistakes, realize those mistakes quickly and take corrective action. That's the first thing I feel a leader should have. Added to this, a leader should be 
vulnerable. He should be willing to put himself out in front of his team and say, I'm sorry, I screwed up. That's the way things are today. But if we have to progress, I've made a mistake. Let's do it. Let's see. You give me an idea what we can do. A leader should be open to new ideas and thought from wherever it comes. It does not matter. Even uh, if your office PN, I'm sorry for uh, you know making a discrimination here or something. Even somebody who's totally disconnected comes up with an idea. You should, as a leader, have the ability to hear that person out and examine it without judgment. Don't be judgmental on that idea. Look at it with an open mind. There have been several instances where solutions have come about from a person who's actually not connected with that uh, project. Next, a leader in today's world, I, uh, some of this terminology of leader gives an impression that you know he's standing out above the crowd and people are following him like Instagram or something like that. It's not, that's not the way uh, leadership is supposed to work today. We are in an era of servant leadership. We have to be part of the crowd, part of the team, walk with the team and know each team member in such a way that we can understand that the team member has certain inherent strengths, certain inherent weaknesses. So instead of harping upon the weaknesses and asking them to you know, improve on those weaknesses, let's work on the strengths. And you can only do that if you are part of them, you're working with them, you have understood what is required of them, and you're able to galvanize them into action. Next, we must be as leaders, be able to do two things. This is critical to any organization. Number one, be able to see the big picture. That big picture is something which a leader must, must, must visualize. And that is uh, related to a vision or strategy. You can give it again terminologies, but that big picture has to be very clear in the mind of the leader. That's okay. I've got it clear, crystal clear. You know where we are going in 2040 will be the world leader. It's, it's there in my mind. Again, my favorite phrase, so what? Unless I can break down this vision of 2040 into actionables and understandables for the people in my team and get them to execute it, this vision is of no use. It's not going to happen. So these are some of the critical capabilities which I feel are required in a leader and definitely add to that humility. And most, most important is empathy. In uh, my uh, work as, as uh, when I do the 21st century leader program, I say that emotional intelligence is a superpower of the 21st century. And that's what is going to get the best out of any workforce not any amount of money or uh, you know temptation or uh, you know the carrot or stick it's not going to get the best out of your people you have to resonate with the people you're working with you have to empathize with them understand where they're coming from leverage their strengths and do the best you can genuinely for them so i do hope uh, that's some of the things which you are looking for molly thank you very much so Pallavi, ma'am, please ask your question. Yeah, good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. It was a wonderful presentation. I just want to know, since you have been giving training on leadership skills, so I just want to know what are the strategies you are employing to build up a leader? Okay, that's uh, an interesting question. Uh, I have no strategy. I have no strategy because every human being is unique. We learn differently, we understand differently, we apply differently. So I have no set piece strategy that I'll do A, B, C, D with you and you will become a leader. No. I work with a leader. I try to understand that leader first, where he or she is coming from, what are the challenges which he or she is facing and what are their personal beliefs. Now, if you look at... Uh, Human change. How does a human being change? I'll take a, a couple of minutes here. The deepest level of human change is at the spiritual level. Okay. A spiritual leader tells us, stand on, on one foot and look towards the north and 
all your wishes will happen. We'll blindly do that. That's the deepest level of human change. That's the level at which we are committed to a particular thought process. The next level of change, the lower level, is at the values. Every human being has values. We all have a set of values. It's not honesty, integrity, loyalty, which I'm talking about. It's what's valuable to me. It can be anything. Power is valuable to me. Money is valuable to me. Family is valuable to me. Talking on such platforms is valuable to me. These are my values. They may not be your values. But these values dictate the way you form beliefs. I'll give you an example, which will uh, set this thing in a little bit of more perspective. But when I was in the army, for me, punctuality, punctuality for me is a value. I will, I've never been late in my life. I will always be there at least 10 minutes in advance. I was at this presentation 15 minutes in advance. Okay, that's that's my value. So uh, when I was in the army, anybody who came late to my meeting or anything, I this value generated a belief. Punctuality truly is the virtue of kings and queens. So if anybody is not on time, that means he or she is not a king or queen and does not deserve to be treated like that. So anybody who was late to my meeting or anything, I said, why are you late? You have wasted five minutes of my life. Who gave you that right? So that value of mine dictated a particular or created a particular belief, which created a particular thought and created a particular action. And that created a behavior. And we are the sum total of our behaviors. So when working with a leader, we need to understand what are his set of values, because that's what drives the way he or she functions. So that's the next thing I do. I get into value elicitation uh, process, understand where he or she is coming from, then work at the belief and value level to realign and create a path ahead for that leader. I hope uh, that uh, answers yeah, the question. I just have one more question like that. You say no. that I analyze the people and accordingly I train them with all those things, like what, what value sets has to be like now, stressed and what not and how you can promote that those things. But you would just tell me one thing, how a trainer just taking just two days of a session can like analyze one single person and you come up with a strategy to teach him the leadership skills in that way. This is slightly confusing. I really want to know until and unless you have a module or a leadership skill training structure, such structure, how the analysis could be done in a single day and then you adopt that strategy and then you go ahead and inculcating those uh, qualities and promoting those things. So slightly like, uh, if you can give a clear idea of the things. Okay, Pallavi, these are two separate issues which you're talking about here. Okay. The program which we did with the railways is a different program and the transformation of leadership is a different program. Transformation of leadership happens over a minimum three to six month period. Okay. Wherein, uh, I offer this program in two ways. One is it's a standalone program. A 21st century leadership is available on my website. Please go buy it, use it. And whatever learning you derive from it, you apply it. The second way I use that program is you buy that program and we have one-to-one -one interventions where I coach you specifically one-on-one. -on -one. Or if you're talking about a team, I can take a team and do this one-on-one, -on -one, uh, do it with the team as well as a team coaching event. So I do a four to six sessions uh, inter. Uh, mingled with the uh, online modules. That's a totally separate domain. Let's leave this aside. When we're talking about railways and uh, the, the Karmiyovigi program, what we did was we went down uh, to railway stations. We spoke with almost uh, 300, 400 uh, railway employees. We took surveys of customers. We took the railway data. Then we understood what are the actual challenges which need to be addressed. Addressed. And out of that, we can't address all the challenges. We can't address all the challenges. So we identified along with the railways, what are the top challenges? So we prioritized one or two challenges. Then we took those one or two challenges and created a value system which would appeal across a broad base. For example, uh, we started, we created this concept of karma yogi. In, in, in our Indian culture, we are used to either a karamchari who only does his work or a yogi who is in the spiritual world. So we introduced a concept of becoming a karma yogi where you are doing your work 
and doing it with a spiritual angle to it and by appealing to these higher values which most of us have at some form or the other we were able to compress the transformation into a period of two days so it's not a very deep level uh, change which we are looking at okay because we are only looking at changing one or two things uh, we were dealing with uh, absolute ground level people you know uh, ticket collectors and uh, station masters these uh, you know commercial staff so that they were able to become better situational leaders they were able to handle their dealing with the public in a better manner and that's where uh, we worked on on one or two th- issues not on 100 issues okay so i, I hope that's clarified yeah thank you thank okay, you okay sir so last question by samir sir uh thank you ajay ji for such a great presentation and the question the bombardment of the questions that you are having at this point of time uh carrying forward to amresh sir's question i have two uh, sub parts to it one there are certain uh, services where uh, they are just you know, what we can say they are evergreen services evergreen professions say say financial services uh, education maybe uh, say medicine medical uh, uh, related so where they there will be some uh, correlations between one and the other services and innovation is very difficult right or, or the the, uh, the lines will be the same there will be leaders but if a person wants to start his business on the similar lines will you support as a startup or not number 1 number 2 what if a person gets a seed funding say everything is done and the seed funding is provided what uh, are the say the, the people who are putting in their money what kind of returns they are looking at in the first initial 3 to 5 years of uh, the say implementation because those the 80% of the startups fail during first 5 years 80 to 85% so uh, if you can share your thoughts on that okay so, so samir i understand it as two separate questions one where in somebody is having a startup which is modeled along existing lines should yes. it be funded or should it not be funded yeah that's one question right yeah okay so now uh, i'll bounce it back to you would you fund it your uh, dhan creators would you fund it yes or why no? not if i have experience on the lines if i have the program uh, the pro- projection lined up uh, for the growth and if i see my industry growing at 30% cagr and my i have a potential to grow at 40 to 50% cagr why not why not very good question so what would you look for you you have the business model because that's already modeled on a successful up and running system so what would you be looking for in the person who has come to you with this idea see i will show him the growth trajectory of the industry for the last say 8 10 years and the successful people who have actually delivered the things and with the experience and the expertise i have i can showcase and uh, uh, get the funding out of it and, and and if i have a potential to scale it up why not why not see so basically- as a as an entrepreneur i have limitations right i have a limitation when i start off a project first 5 years i need to sustain myself and then the scalability things come but if i want to scale it up say i have one one and a half years into the system and i now i need some seed funding to scale it up to get the manpower done to uh, if i have the potential to beat industry by 100% on the growth part why not but point is as a new idea new idea so Uh, it's not possible for a new idea that if india is ha- is under penetrated on insurance or on mutual funds or on equities and there is a scalability say if, if it's penetrated to 3% 4% there is a huge scope to scale it up why not why will you not fund it so i think you answered your own question see that's what i am saying so the point is ki what i mean to say new idea my question is why what is the new idea for you okay uh, the thing which we need to understand is that there are very few new ideas there is a difference between creativity and innovation we must understand that difference and that difference is critical 
creativity brings about a very very new idea something which has not been done in the world ever innovation is the ability to do the same thing differently and that's what you should be looking for if there's an insurance model which is working it's working it's successful you've seen that that's part of uh, what you are seeing and it's already proved itself over five decades seven decades all you have to do at this point of time is see if that new idea or rather the innovation which is being brought you know a lot of people say uh, 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 what is that old wine in a new bottle that's okay old wine in a new bottle if it is selling why not so the feasibility and the scalability has to be examined along with the people who are actually going to deliver it these are the three key areas which i would look for if i was putting my money in it it's okay i don't need a new idea i don't need a new idea i need an idea or an innovation which is going to work which is going to get me my roi that's what is important and i should be i should be delivering value to people that's the bottom line on which you will get your roi so if i see that in a in a person who's come to me with a startup idea now it may be modeled after anything i don't care if he's uh, just pressed control c control v and brought me an idea i don't care what's his way of going about it what's the energy he brings to it what is his commitment level what is the plan for the roi that's what i would be looking for got it and the second part sir uh, what kind of roi the uh, the seed fund uh, funding and or the vcs are looking at see i am not into that line so i'll really not be able to give you a fair answer on this i barely manage to invest in my own insurance so <laughs> it's very difficult for me to be an investor but uh, applying certain logics any investor i i, I would uh, i mean i'm talking totally out of my domain this is uh, more i think up molly's uh, uh, alley than me but i'll take a shot at it any investor i'm talking as a human being as a normal human being if i put in money i want maximum in the fastest time that's every one of us it's human human nature now it is up to you as the startup guy to convince me that my plan is such that it may be slow and steady but this is how it is going to go stage 1 this is what is going to happen stage 2 this is going to happen stage 3 this is going to happen and then you're going to be sitting on a pile of money it's up to you to convince me it's up to you to bring about the data facts and uh, you know the timelines which align with my thinking and change my thinking to align with yours thank you so thank you sir we are already running out of time so <laughs> i would like to call alok to conclude this meeting and next sunday we will be coming up with the new speaker very interesting session today and lots of inputs from ajay sir and uh, from you you really lead us from 1903 to 2011 where you know uber started till the journey of you know that think out 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 of box you know which is like the most important you know factors in this five years what is coming up think out of the box but you know people are thinking but they are feeling right so it's like i would like to relate this with only with one thing is like you know how as you are a army person right so first you know we always have the challenge to train ourselves right but here like in startups like what is happening is that they come up with the ideas but you know there is no experience that how to analyze it what is the business plan they are dependent on others but they are not having their self confident that you know i should negotiate here i should negotiate here with the seed funds or for the venture capitalist or let it be anyone or even with your own father or you know or with the family members right so you know similar ideas can lead to success it's not that only innovation is required right innovation leads to you know a generation growth i rather say which will lead to 
past five years down the line, you see a generation growth, right? You see a latest news of 5G coming up to India, right? Which was already thought three to four years back, right? So, you know, it is an innovation growth uh, where technology is improvised, but, you know, it's a sim similar, you know, concept which is leading to innovations, right? So I always say that, you know, train yourself to train others where, you know, we need to train ourselves first, then we need to have an correct business analyst to, you know, to go with a venture. I don't think so that uh, the success rate will be, or uh, or the unsuccess rate, I rather say, will be uh, very much, you know, it will be in at risk, I rather say. So, you know, keeping all these things in mind that, you know, these startups are failing because they are very much energetic to their, uh, uh, to their, uh, let's say, to their ideas rather than, you know, improvising themselves on the whole analysis, how they need to improvise, how they need to show the growth. So, you know, that's why the whole equity, right, it's getting diluted without any business, right? People give you something, but it dilutes very fast. So, you know, these are the, you know, uh, let's say, I rather say, I'm just like, uh, summarizing it. So with this, I would like to end this session and thank you, sir, for the valuable inputs.